Greetings class, Professor Steve here. I want to start the um, course, Introduction to Oceanography, with a quick introduction to Introduction to Oceanography. And really what I want to get across is why, why does it matter? Oceanography means study of the ocean, and why do we do it? We put an awful lot of time and money and energy into, into getting to know the oceans. Um, and so why is that? Why is it so important? Um, and if you're asking, um, is it because of the cute animals, the answer is not so much because, uh, and hopefully we'll explain that quite a bit uh, th th as the course goes on. Uh, but as an example, um, let's just look at uh, humans and how they interact in one very simple, what should be um, a familiar way with, with the earth. In fact, and you can do this as a practical exercise right now by breathing in and out. So if you breathe in and breathe out, what are we breathing in? What do we need from the air? And of course the answer to that is oxygen. <clears throat> we breathe in oxygen. Uh, we, we do that because we need that oxygen to burn carbon that we consume. Um, turn that carbon into energy. Use it to grow and reproduce. Use it to maintain our cellular integrity and, and fitness. Um, but what do we produce as a byproduct, as a metabolite? And we do that, one of the things we do that with is carbon dioxide. Every time we breathe out, we're exhaling or respiring carbon dioxide. And we see that carbon is in a CO2 or carbon dioxide molecule. So we are, every time we breathe out, we are affecting the carbon cycle of the Earth. Where do we get that oxygen from? And the answer from of that to that is from photosynthesizers. Photosynthesizers, as part of their re, as part of their metabolism, produce oxygen. We breathe in the oxygen, we produce CO2, and then of course the plants take up the CO2. And this is your first look at one of many types of cycles that we'll look at throughout the course. Okay, and this is this is this is what oceanography is, looking at a big picture. Um, how things cycle and everything is interconnected. <clears throat> and what we've skipped so far is where do we get the carbon that comes from the CO2, right? We burn and make energy and make new cells, but where does the CO2 come from? Where's the carbon from there come from? And that is either directly or indirectly from the plants as well. They take up the CO2, they produce organic matter, we either eat plants directly or something eats the plants and we eat it. We also breathe in their oxygen, and you can see how very quickly this could get very complex, right? But CO2 doesn't just go to the plants, but it goes to the atmosphere and affects our climate. What about the ocean? Are there plants in the ocean? The answer to that, you should be able to say, is a resounding yes, right? Here are the more familiar ones. There's two major classes that fall under the umbrella that we would call seaweeds. The first one is kelps. These are what we call mackerel algae. They're big, le bigger, leafier things. Some of them float in these big, giant floating forests. Some of them attach to the seafloor and grow in these giant stalks reaching for the sun at the surface. And we call those kelps. Some are much more uh, familiar looking like sea grasses, um, which actually grow out of a sediment in much the same way that plants do on land. The second group are the phytoplankton, and these are the guys that we'll talk almost exclusively about in this course. Um, the phytoplankton are microscopic organisms. The, the, these three groups right here, the diatoms, dinoflagellates, and coccoliths, um, these guys are actually very genetically similar to us, and they're single-celled, animal-like uh, organisms um, that also have the machinery for photosynthesis. And cyanobacteria is a bacterial group. They're actually bacteria that photosynthesize. And the fact of the matter is, all these microscopic guys, each of which will go into great detail in our primary production lecture, make up the majority of the photosynthesis that comes from the ocean. The reason is there's so many more of these guys and they grow so much more rapidly in the ocean that they, they grossly outweigh the biomass and photosynthesis that is produced by these larger guys. Again, we'll go into it in great detail. But so how do these major photosynthesizers, the microbes in the ocean, stack up against the land photosynthesizers? The answer to that is, for every five breaths you take right now, three of the oxygen molecules you're breathing in come from the ocean photosynthesizers, the phytoplankton, and only two of them come from land. So approximately 70% of the primary production or photosynthesis that happens for the entire globe is done by microbes in the ocean. 
If we look at the carbon cycle as a whole, and you don't have to know this whole thing, but we're going to zero in on, how the, on, on some of the, the pools here, not the rock, not the bedrock, okay, but so here we're talking about gigatons of carbon, which is one billion tons of carbon, one ton is 2,000 pounds of carbon, and so even in the atmosphere, in the air, the air you can't see, the carbon dioxide, if you add it all up, each molecule of carbon dioxide, it adds up to 850 gigatons. But if we look at the pools of carbon that are exchangeable with the atmosphere, those really amount to the ocean, the vegetation, and the soils on land. But if we look at the vegetation, which does photosynthesis, 600 gigatons is roughly the same amount as the atmosphere. But if we look at the ocean, 38,000 gigatons, that's many times than either of these. So the exchange, or the, 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 the reservoir that that, that is the ocean of carbon actually has a much greater impact or controls how much carbon exchanges between these two much more than the other two the atmosphere and the vegetation carbon control it which means it not only has a, a, a say in what the concentration of carbon is in each pool but it also has a strong influence over our atmosphere which means it has a strong influence over our climate so oceanography is what I like to call big picture thinking and that means we can't just focus in on one thing so let's say I'm a fish biologist and I study a salmon I can't quite understand everything about that salmon unless I study what it eats right this is an intertrophic interaction we go from one level in the food chain to the next and I can't understand this guy unless I know what it eats okay so that means that indirectly the food of the salmon's food indirectly has an interaction with this guy. This is what we call trophic cascade, and we'll go over that a little bit more in another lecture. But it also trickles all the way down. I can't understand what, how these two affect him unless I know uh, what, what's going on with the guy that he eats and so on and so forth. And this doesn't have to be eating, it could be any kind of interaction. Um, but it's much more complex than just looking at this one guy, and it's even more complex than that, right? These all affect or are affected by the chemistry. They're either taking up some chemistry in their consumption or, or, or body maintenance, or they're putting out some chemistry in, during their metabolic processes. And then the physics of the ocean is what stirs this all up and guides where it happens and when it happens. And the whole picture adds up to what we call a global phenomenon. And global phenomenon, global phenomena, is just a fancy way of saying that all things interact with each other and the environment and that, that those interactions affect the entire earth, right? We breathe out, we breathe out carbon dioxide, we are either feeding a photosynthesizer or we're changing the concentration in the atmosphere which affects our climate, right? And that's, that's just one very brief and summarized um, example. It's much more complex than that. <clears throat> so if you add up all these processes you can look at one entire food web. Um, and each one of these pools of organisms, um, which, which are pools of, of, of elements, essentially, or whether they're dissolved or in an organism, there's processes that make them change from back and forth from each other and make them cycle around the Earth. And this is essentially a pictorial view of what you're going to learn for this course. Um, and you can't do that without knowing how the biology, the chemistry, and the physics are all mixed up to interact on the Earth and how they're all interconnected. And we have a great word, one of my favorite words of all time, to describe that, and it's called biogeochemistry. So the biology, earth, chemistry, um, and how it interacts. And when we study the cycling of that, we call it biogeochemical cycling. So bio biology, earth, and physics, and chemical cycling. And what I want you to think of when you think of this is the word schnapps. No, not the kind you drink, but this is an anagram to remember carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and sulfur. These are what we call the six major organic elements. And the reason we call them that is because without these six major elements, we cannot combine them into the compounds. We cannot have the, the, the elemental compounds and molecules that we need for life to exist. There are other things that are necessary, trace metals like iron or, um, and, and things like calcium and these kinds of things. Um, but without these six, life doesn't exist. There's no organic molecules. And what we do when we study biogeochemical cycling, which is almost always what we're doing in one way or another in oceanography, is we're studying how these six elements, 
and and the stuff that goes along with them, but these six elements cycle between non-living pools and living pools, inorganic and organic. So from living to non-living and back again. <clears throat> In order to do that, a lot of us focus and specialize on the biology, but again, we can't just focus on one thing. We have to focus how the microbes interact focus on what eats the microbes, focus on what possibly eats those guys, and then also on who eats everybody. But we can't even just focus in on those, we have to actually understand the whole ecosystem, like this coral reef here, um, and how the chemistry, physics, and biology all interact together. But in order to, to understand that, we do need to know the chemistry. We need the chemists. We need to go out and measure and sort of map what's going on out there and why. Why is oxygen this concentration here? Why is, why is nitrogen this concentration there? Who's taking up? Who's making it? Who's producing it? But we also have physical oceanography. And physical oceanographers have to know just about everything, about all how, the laws that govern our Earth and, and our atmosphere, because it's our atmospheric circulation, like what we see here in these cells. And we'll learn well, a lot about this um, throughout the course. That drives a lot of the atmospheric circulation, the wind patterns that you, you feel and, and experience every day. And it's those things that drive everything from small-scale circulation, like a common wave, which everybody should be familiar with a wave, to the global conveyor belt. Nope, not the conveyor belt in the supermarket, but what we call the ocean, great ocean conveyor belt, which is essentially the largest version of ocean circulation that, that, that the Earth experiences. It's essentially the largest pattern in the way the oceans circulate, and we'll go over that in great detail um, after the first exam, actually. We can't measure any of these things without having technology, right? So we have technological oceanographies, for lack of a better term. We have to invent all these fancy ways to go out and measure things so that we can do it better and then have, a, have a better understanding of these things and, and better ways of, of, of correlating them together. And there's not just the surface ocean. If you studied everything you could see from going around the entire ocean and you hit every spot in every ocean and studied everything at the surface, you would only be scratching the surface because the majority of the ocean exists in the deep ocean. Okay, Below the surface is, is where most of the ocean lies. And so we have to study that. We, we need, again, we need technology and ways of getting down there, such as submarines like the Alvin. And then last but not least, we need to um, be modeling oceanographers. We need to be able to take all this information we learn, plug it into a computer, the data, stick it all together, and draw a big picture of the entire Earth um, of what's going on. And in this way, we can make predictions, predictions in the way things are going to change, predict, prediction estimates of what went on in the past and what's going to happen in the future, and most importantly, how do humans affect the Earth and the ocean, and how can we um, better interact with that without disturbing it. And that's it for today, and I hope you um, I hope you get the gist. You can rewatch this as much as you want, as well as the future slideshows. And um, welcome to the class, and see you next lecture.